Now please be quiet, turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. We don't have a Bible to share with other people. Oh, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Please have a Bible with you. If you want to take notes, you're more than welcome to underline or just uh, highlight the Bible or, re- or write it in your notebooks. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Are you all there? 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I would encourage you to take some notes. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I'll read from verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible reads, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may get yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Let speak this by permission, and not of commandment, why would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. The title of the sermon tonight is Dating Advice in Light of the Bible. Dating Advice in Light of the Bible. You may think it's a pretty light and relaxing subject, but it's actually a pretty serious subject addressing in the Bible. Now let's take a look at verse number 6. Paul said, But I speak this by commission and not of commandment. So it's not a command from God. So it's here. It's Paul speaking, For I would that all men were even as myself. When the Bible uses the word would, means he wants to. The King James language translates the modern vernacular is, I want that all men were even as I myself. Paul, as we all know, he has never been married. He is what we call a biblical eunuch. Basically, he remains single, dedicating himself to God. He's saying, I want all men like himself to be single, but every man has his proper gift of God. So not everyone has the gift to be single. Not every man and woman has the gift to, to control the, the desires to be married. So the Bible says, if they cannot contain, verse 9, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Burning what? Burning lust. So the Bible says, if you you cannot control the urge to get married, if you cannot control the urge to get physical, get married, for it is better to be married than to burn. So not everyone has the gift to remain single. I do believe uh, most of us are designed to be married, because over and over again, the Bible talks about marriage as a good thing unto God. Only a small minority is to be biblically unique to dedicate himself as a single person to serve God. So one of the reasons to get married is that you don't burn in lust anymore. You may think it's a pretty strange reason to get married, but this is what the Bible says. To avoid fornication the lust of the eyes. Now go to verse 36 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse number 36. The Bible reads, in 1 Corinthians 7, 36, But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncommonly toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and needs so require, let him do what he will, and he sinneth not, let him marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, do it well. So Paul is saying, if any man think he behaved uncommonly, means improperly towards his virgin, if he cannot control his desire, let them marry. It's a good thing. But in verse 37, if he can control the urge, it's good to remain single. Both ways is acceptable in light of the Bible. And throughout the Bible, it talks about if it's good to be married. Now go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. At the end of the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13. While you are turning there, let me read from you Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Now in Hebrews chapter 13, let's look at verse number 4. Hebrews 13, 4. The Bible reads, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bad undefiled. The whole mongers and adulterers God will judge. 
So marriage is a sacred thing. It's good for men to be married because it's not good for men to be alone. That's why God created woman. Woman simply means out of man, woman, to be a helper. Now, if you would turn to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. It's in the beginning, it's in the middle of the Bible after the book of Psalms. Proverbs chapter 19. While you are turning there, let me read from you Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. The Bible reads, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Now in Proverbs 19, verse 14, let's see what the Bible has to say. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Again, talk about it's good to be married. God gave you the godly man or woman in the future to, for you to be married with. Of course, in Matthew 19, 4, Jesus is talking about um, that he which made them in the beginning, made them male and female, that they should join to one. These twin shall become one, and let no man uh, put them asunder. Let no man tear them apart. So marriage is a sacred thing. It's a good to be married. Now, there's a decline in the marriage rate throughout all the globe. So I did a study among the age 18 to age 29. Back in 1960, 59% of the people from age 18 to 29 are married. But now, the rates decline to 20%. And there's a populational crisis in the country of Japan. Among age 50, it's pretty old, right? Among age 50, one out of the four men are not married, and one out of seven women are not married. They have no desire to be married at all. So it, it becomes a strange thing. And also, 61% of the men in their 20s and 70% of the men in their 30s have no desire to be married. So I do believe there's probably 1 or 2% of people that desire to be single, but the majority are supposed to be married. If a country the majority don't feel like being married, and it is not natural. You see how ungodly Japan is. Because we are designed to be married, it's a good thing unto God. And also in China, even though I came from China five years ago, but I don't want to downplay it. You know, they have a one-child policy. You only allow to have one child. If you need, have to have more than one child, if you pay more money to the government. The Bible commands us to be fruitful and multiply. Part of the physical application is to have kids, to bring glory to God, be fruitful. And, and, and also, the spiritual application is to win souls to Christ. They are your spiritual sons, they are your spiritual daughters, if you, if you win someone to Christ. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So one of the reasons to uh, be married is to avoid fornication. If you are certain that man or woman is who God has designed, is who God has for you, if you cannot contain, get married, it's a good thing. Because living as a single man or woman is a very dangerous thing. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 6, 13, the Bible reads, Meets for the belly and belly for me, for God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power, knowing not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Knowing not that the which is joined to an harlot is one body for two said he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Bible is talking that our body is the temple of the, of, of the Holy Spirit. We are bought with a, with a price. We are made in God's image, body and soul and spirit, so we can have a relationship with God. Because when you're committing fornication, basically, it's basically it's, you are sleeping together outside of marriage. But don't confuse fornication with adultery. Adultery is you are sleeping with someone who is married. The Bible speaks very strongly against fornication. And, and, and Jesus talked about when the Pharisees tried to trouble him, asking, should we pay taxes? And Jesus asked them, whose image is on the superscription of the coin? And Jesus said, Caesar's. 
So then Jesus said, you know, render unto Caesar the things belong to Caesar, and unto God the things belong to God. So what things belong to God is our body, because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So don't eat all this kind of junk food, defiling your body, don't commit fornication, all these uh, wicked thoughts. It's a directly violation, it's a direct defiling, it's a despisement against God's perfect commandment. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible reads in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Again, talking about uh, fornication is a serious sin. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife to benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So, the only purpose of dating is for marriage. Period. And don't carry the thought that you're just playing around, having more experience, dating five women at the same time. No, it is wicked. The only purpose of marriage, the only purpose of dating should be marriage. And some people say, don't date at all. But I think dating is a very important process. You get to know each other. Because when you're getting, to, when you're getting married, you're married for a long time, until you die. So you have to know what you're getting into. Now... These are all the introduction. <laughs> Let's go to the main point. So first, go to Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. So the title of the sermon is "Dating Advice in Light of the Bible." Now, the first principle, first advice, you have to marry a believer. Everyone knows that you have to marry a believer. The famous verse in Second Corinthians chapter six, verse fourteen, the Bible reads, "Be not unequally yoked with, together with unbelievers, for what fellowship?" hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So the Bible is talking about what fellowship hath Christ with the devil, basically that's Belial is, and what concord uh, have you with an infidel? Basically, you shouldn't have any fellowship with the unsaved. Now, turn to Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah chapter 13 in the Old Testament. Nehemiah chapter 13. But while we are turning there, remember the sermon I preached about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the popcorn sermon, the hair will grow again, talking about Samson to marry all these heathen women. And when Samson married the Philistine woman, what happened to the woman? She died, right? So Samson married an unsaved, a heathen woman, and she died. So I joked about do not marry an, un an unsafe woman that she might die. Of course, that's a joke. So in Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23, Nehemiah 13, 23, the Bible reads, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jewish language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him, did outlandish women cause to sin, shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives. Now, Solomon is probably one of the wisest, one of the smartest king you know, in the, among the children of Israel. Yet, his downfall is marrying heathen women. The Bible says marrying strange wives. Marrying strange wives. And what is the punishment? You know, this thing eventually caused the Israel to split. You know, the northern kingdom of, of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Later, it's been taken captive by the Assyrians and then by the, by the, ba the Babylonian Empire. I know you love Babylon. So, the Babylonian Empire take captive the, uh, the, the, the Assyrians and then eventually taken over by the Roman Empire. And if you are living a godly life, you shouldn't have any in common with the unsafe anyway. So if you are thinking uh, you should date an unsafe people carrying the thought that you're going to get him converted along the way of dating, what if that does not happen? You get so emotionally involved and then by the time it may be too late. So not only should marry a believer, you should also date a believer. What if it's been too late? And also if you're living a godly wife, you shouldn't have anything in common to have fellowship with the unsafe anyway. If you, if you have a lot of fellowship with the unsaved, maybe you are not living a godly life. 
So that's what the Bible says. What, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And not only that, you should date a believer. If you are a King James only independent fundamental Baptist, you should also consider dating an independent fundamental Baptist. Because if you are not using the same Bible, people are seeing rock music, or these Hollywood movies, or these kind of promiscuous dressings, how can you have fellowship with one another? By the way, there are hundreds of verse versions out there. The NIV, the New International Version, as I would call it, the not inspired version. The ESV, English Standard Version. The NASB, New American Standard Version. And also the NLT, New Legal Translation. There are hundreds of Bible versions out there. Now, these translations are just not good. They are satanic. It's designed by the devil to corrupt Bible doctrines. They attack the deity of Christ. They attack the doctrine of salvation. They attack the virgin birth of Christ. They, they, they attack every single doctrine. So don't carry the thought these Bible versions are just easy to understand. We understand the King James Version. Maybe we are smarter than them. You know, people are talking about the new version are easy to understand. No, it's not. They remove verses from the Bible and they add these corrupted passages which does not make any sense. People are always talking to me like the Bible is full of con contradiction. And then I ask them to show me a contradiction from the Bible. And then they pull up a, an NIV. And I tell, told them, I can show you the contradiction from the NIV, but if you go to the King James, you cannot find one. Of course, we believe the King James is the preserved word of God without error for the English-speaking people. I believe it is inspired. There's no error, no contradiction. So imagine when you're married, you're using a different Bible version, you're having a Bible study, you're teaching your kids. It just does not work out. And if you are a spiritually filled, a godly Christian, how can you have fellowship with, <coughs> with the person who's listening to rock music, who's all this kind of worldly, carnal junk out there? The Bible says, to be friends with the word is enmity with God. For it's, it is not subject to the, to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, this, this sermon you are hearing today is a fundamental biblical preaching. It's not the liberal churches give you a 20 minute of motivational speech with no doctrine. What you are hearing tonight is a fundamental biblical preaching. You are actually learning some doctrines here. You are learning some doctrine from Pastor Murdoch, from Brother Bro, from every other teachers here. Not the liberal kind of fun center. They dim the light like a Hollywood show. No, it is wicked. It's not church. This is not part of the sermon. I just added everything in that story. So the first principle you have to date is say born again Christian. Now the second principle, go to Proverbs chapter 19. The book of Proverbs chapter 19. While you're turning there, let me read from you Proverbs 3, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible reads, that's the most famous verse. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So the first advice is you have to date a born-again saved Christian. Second point, you have to let God guide you. You have to be patient. Let God guide you. Be patient. Now, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 13, the Bible reads, A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Again, in Psalm 37, verse 7, the Bible reads, Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Now, I'm all for you marrying young. You can learn responsibility, you can learn life skills, but you have to be patient and let God guide you. Does that make sense? Marrying young is a good thing, but you have to make sure that person is what God has for you. But you have to talk to women, though, boys. In order to get to know each other, don't just not talking at all. A normal conversation is okay. The Bible does not say, thou shalt not talk to the opposite gender, otherwise thou shalt be stoned or shot through, okay? <laughs> the Bible does not say that. you got to talk to women, though. you got to get to know each other, otherwise how should you know if she's for you in the future? And here's the test. If, if I find some lady who is not from this church, I will bring her to Lighthouse Baptist Church. If she does not like the church, I don't like you. Okay? That would be the test if I had someone else in the church. That's a great test to test if that is the person what God has for you. So, number one, save warning in Christian. Number two, let God guide you. Be patient. Number three, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. The third principle, the third advice is 
He has to be a hard worker. Now I'm mainly talking to man here. Man has to be a hard worker, okay? Of course, in Genesis 3:19, the Bible says, "In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return." Of course, in Exodus 20, it's talking about six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. So I think the principle of the Bible is if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. It's that simple. But I actually feel pre pretty, pretty ashamed since I'm on a student visa from China. I'm not legally to work outside of a campus. My family are supporting me. I came here five years ago as, as an atheist and I became a Christian the first week when I came to America. Just a, throw a little testimony here. Uh, so my family was supporting me to go to college, go to, to go to Purdue University. If you have it, please don't go there. Uh, so, but I actually find a part-time job. Uh, actually, yesterday, last night was my first time working in the dining court. I was washing dishes. It's like so much fun getting myself all wet and like it's pretty fun. Is it like a slip and slide? Kind of. But, but at least I'm working. At least I don't. I feel like I'm a man now because men are designed to work six days shall thou labor, not five days, not the normal forty-hour week. You shall keep working. You know. Take one day off, it's good. And then, I'm not a huge fan of women working. I'm not a huge fan of women working, but uh, last Saturday, uh, me and uh, one of my friends went to Chick Chick fil A and I saw Sammy work there. And uh, actually, I feel happy because I love seeing people working, you know. But there's one thing I ordered a chicken sandwich, okay? And, <laughs> and someone brought me two chicken wraps. I was thinking, did I say something yeah, wrong when I when I ordered the food? Maybe I was speaking Chinese at that point. <laughs> and it's so expensive. This almost cost me ten dollars. And I ate two more meals after that before I go to sleep. So, but, but the good thing is at least I'm working now. So I may go to Chick Fil A every single week. Not have the money. But, but God willing. And of course, in the famous verse in the, in the book of Ephesians, talking about that. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. So, ladies, you are not only looking for a godly, saved young man, but you are also looking for a strong worker, a strong leader. <laughs> He has to be provide for your family. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. Sorry, I, I think I had to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible reads, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith, and it's worse than an infidel. So the Bible says, if young man, you cannot provide for your family, you are basically worse than the unsaved. So you should work hard, you should be able to support your family. So you don't have to send your wife to work in the future, okay, if you work hard right now. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible reads, I will, means I want, therefore the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Again, I'm not a strong fan of women working, but if the husband is able to provide for the family, then ideally the wife should be stay at home as it is written in the scripture. The Bible says clearly, I will that young woman marry, bear the children, guide the house, give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Because we have so much preconceived ideas from the world, from the movies, from the billboards, that, tell, that talk about we should all go to work. That's not what the Bible says. Listen, if you disagree with what I'm saying today, show me a verse from the Bible too. Show me a verse from the Bible. Now, go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Now, this chapter is commonly known as a virtuous woman. Proverbs chapter 31. Let's take a look at verse number 10 of Proverbs chapter 31. <laughs> Proverbs 31, verse number 10. The Bible reads, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. So shall he so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. Talking about women making clothing, some daily, some daily needs. Verse 14, she is like the merchant's ships, 
she bring up her food from afar, talking about going grocery shopping, you know, picking up all, the, all these coupons, all these savings, going shopping, providing food. Verse 15, she rises also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. Again, providing her family with foods even it is early in the morning. How can I know it's a godly wife if she cook uh, breakfast as dinner? You know, cooking needs a lot of time. If, listen, if she's worked out there, none of you will feel like cooking from scratch. You'll probably eat, you can probably eat takeout more and more often if you're both working. In the long run, yeah, actually, you're not saving money, to be honest. Actually, I eat five meals, so if she can cook five meals, that'd be wonderful. I'm gonna have to <laughs> Verse 16. Verse 16 of Proverbs 31, verse 16, she considered a field and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hand she planted a vineyard, she girded her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle good not out by night. Again, a full-time housekeeper, right? A full-time housekeeper. Now keep your finger at Proverbs 31, turn to Titus chapter 2. Keep your fingers at that, we're going to turn right back. Go to Titus chapter 2, after the book of 2 Timothy, Titus chapter number 2. Titus 2, let's look at verse number 1. Titus chapter 2, verse number 1, Bible reads, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So what I'm going to say is sound doctrine, okay? Don't argue with me. The Bible says, which becomes sound doctrine. Verse number 2, And the aged man be sober, grave, temperance, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged women likewise, that they which be in behavior as become coyness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach young women to be sober, to love their husband, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, what's the next phrase, keepers at home. What, what, what does that mean? It means keepers at home. Keepers at home means keepers at home, means a housekeeper. Is that clear? <laughs> good, obedient to their own husband, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's a sound doctrine. Now go to verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, that no man despise thee. So the Bible is clear. This is some doctrine. These things speak. These things we should preach them. I don't want to break this. <laughs> the Bible says, women, wives are designed to be keepers at home. It means keepers at home. Don't try to twist that verse. Now go to Proverbs chapter 31. Flip back. Let's finish that passage. Verse 19 of Proverbs chapter 31, the Bible reads, She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the pool. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. Talking about a uh, wife being loving, caring, and kind. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of wise, of kindness. So another characteristic you should look for is that women should be wise. And I'm all for women getting educated, okay? I'm all for women getting smart because you can discern which man is a feminine, is not manly, is not a strong leader. You should be smart, okay? But you don't have to go to college to get educated. Listen, I'm not against going to college, but suppose you want to learn something about cooking, it's better for you to actually do it. If you want to learn something about astronomy, suppose you go to a library, there's a section called astronomy. And you, and you read all the books from that shelf, you can get so much more, save so much time than going to college. Again, I'm not against going to college, but there are some better ways to learn. Of course, it's good to go to college so you can homeschool your kids. I know public school is a, is a very dangerous place. If you, if you have enough knowledge, if you're smart, you can provide strong education for your kids because the public school is corrupt. They don't even teach you. I have to learn by myself at college. They don't even teach you. I read my own book, I watch videos online to get more stuff. So we should be smart so we can educate our children to provide them into a nicer educational society. Now, the Bible says in verse 27 of Proverbs chapter 31, She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. 
her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but the woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. This is a great verse. Verse 31, give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. You see, over and over and over again, the Bible talks about the role of a wife is to bear children and die the house. Keep her at home, okay? Now, and, and also when you are trying to find, when you date someone, he or she at least has to be attracted to you. She does not need to be attracted to your parents, to pastor, to brother bro. She needs to be attracted to you because you're going to be married for a long time. You're going you're gonna to get to know what you're getting into. Does that make sense? That's why dating is so important so you can get to know each other. Because when you get married, it becomes a covenant. It becomes a, a bond, a legal bond. Now go to Romans chapter 7. I was memorizing the book of the, the book of Romans, and I uh, saw so many hidden parallels in the book of Romans. Romans chapter seven. Let's look at verse number one. Romans chapter seven, verse one. The Bible reads in Romans seven one. Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband. So long as she still loves me. Is that what the Bible says? So long as she not cook cooking for me. As long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So based on this passage, the only end of marriage is death. That's why the wedding vow is till death do us apart. That's where that comes from. The only end of marriage is death. And uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. And also, Jesus, Jesus is talking about uh, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, commit adultery. So the Bible is saying, if you divorce your wife, you are actually causing her to commit... To commit, to commit, to commit uh, I can't say that. To commit... Adultery. And, and if you're marrying a, a man or a woman that's being divorced, you're committing adultery by yourselves. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10. The Bible says, Now unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So here's God speaking, it's the commandment. Let not the wife <coughs> depart from her husband, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the, the husband put away his wife. So the Bible is talking about if you have being divorced, there are only two options. Stay single or get remarried. If you marry someone else, you committed adultery. It's that simple. Go to verse 39. Verse 39, the Bible says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So the only end of marriage is death, but if your husband is dead, you can marry, but only in the Lord. Of course, we have read from Hebrews 13, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But homeowners and, and also adulterers, God will judge, because marriage is the most important relationship you can enter on this earth. The most important, very sacred relationship. Actually, love is one word in English, the full word in Greek. In Greek, we have agape, filio, storge, and eros. Agape, God's love. You know, storge, brother love. Filio, I think storge is the parental love. Filio is brother love, and eros is romantic love. So there are four kinds of love. Only marriage combined is love together. It's a very sacred thing. Because it's become a legal bond, and it's become an everlasting covenant till death. So we've so far gone through three major points of dating, dating advice. First, uh, a believer, a safe Christian. Second, let God guide you, be patient. Number three, a hard worker for men, a hard housekeeper for women. And number four, turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Number four, make not provision for the flesh. Make not provision for the flesh. Romans chapter 13. Make not provision for the flesh. Romans 13, verse 12, the Bible reads, in Romans chapter 13, verse number 12, 
The Bible reads, Night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So people tend to do good things when they are in daylight, you know. But what about when you're in the dark? What about the majority of the time when you're not at church? Are you only living a Christian life Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night, Sunday night? Or are you living a Christian life throughout the week? Or are you only a Christian when you're around with fellow Christians? Being in the daylight forces us to do good things because people are watching. So that gives us a great, great principle, great advice for dating. Have a day during the day in public, but not, not in the night, not in your apartment building, not in your bedroom. Having day in the day, because it is much easier for your flesh to get weak when you're in the dark. We want to try our best to prevent any possible cause when dating. Okay, because we have a sinful flesh, sometimes we unintentionally enter into some evil thoughts. That's why dating in public keeps us accountable. Or maybe have a partner to keep you accountable, to call you every single time when you... Your, when your evil thoughts begin to take in place, maybe having a lunch or dinner in a restaurant, having your parents sitting on the table on the other side. Therefore, you are alone, but not truly alone. Does that make sense? Keep yourself accountable for everything you do. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to talk more about the physical context, about making up provision for the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. The Bible reads in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now if you interpret this verse literally, you are not supposed to touch a woman. But, how, but you, you have to interpret Bible verse in light of the scripture. Now go back to Proverbs chapter 6. Keep your fingers at 1 Corinthians 7. Go back to Proverbs chapter number 6. Let's, let, let the word... Let, let the, let the Bible define what the word touch means. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25. Proverbs 6, verse 25, the Bible reads, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom? and his clothes be not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. So in context, touching means committing, committing adultery, right? In that passage. And, 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 and also, the reason I think this First Corinthians 7, not to touch a woman, cannot be inter interpreted literally is, is you remember the woman who, uh, who actually anointed Jesus with the oil? He washes Jesus with his tears. He also he kisses Jesus' feet. So that's physical contact, but it's normal. It's non-amorous physical contact. So normal physical contact is okay. By the way, shake my hand. Should, should I be put to death? I mean, this is a very weird. This is nonsense, right? So, but but if you, if shaking hands causes you to committing fornication, don't do that. If any physical contact causes you to think otherwise, don't do that. But normal contact, it, it, is, it is okay. Because the woman gave it to, to Jesus. It's not amorous. It's not uh, too much. You can't just have no contact at all when you're dating. Listen to me. It's going to be very, very weird. You never touch each other when you're dating. And when you're married, you're sleeping together. It's going to be very, very weird. You cannot have no contact at all. Normal contact is okay, but don't get overboard, okay? If you're just trying to see how much you can get to the edge of committing fornication, by that time, it may, might be too late. Don't torture yourself. The more you put in, the more you torture yourself. Try to have a limit. There's a saying that says that pleasure for a moment, but pain for a lifetime. So, you should draw the line, normal contact is okay, but don't get overboard. And imagine when you are trying to lose weight, you are on a diet, it's easier to skip a meal than to have a half breakfast, like two chicken wraps from Chick-fil-A. Like Kimmy wants to eat more and more and more. So don't even try that. Don't try to see how physical you can get. Otherwise, it might be too late. And 
and also the good rule of thumb is if you are comfortable doing the act with your, fam with your family member or with another man, it's probably okay. If you are comfortable doing the act with your family member, then it's probably okay. And you didn't shut your phone. Alright, who wants to help me? That is your phone. I want the man to help me with this illustration. Who wants to help me? How do you it? Okay, so here's a great rule of thumb. If, if you are okay to do the act with the same gender, it's probably okay. Now, shake my hands. It's pretty, it's pretty normal. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty normal. Is it normal for people to watch? No. If, if, I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I do this, it's also normal, right? But if I want to kiss him in the cheek, then, that's going to be weird, right? Yeah, it's no, it's not normal to kiss on the um, cheek. That is probably not okay to do when you're dating if you think about that way. I mean, the normal kind is okay. I mean, this is okay. She can kiss is okay. This is okay. Uh, also, this uh, is not okay. Also, maybe this should have done. It's okay. It's so. okay. <laughs> okay, don't, don't, don't kill me. And also, the Bible says, greet each other with a holy kiss, right? The Bible says that, uh, greet each other with a holy kiss. So, based on the culture, the, I mean, the normal greeting, handshake is okay. If you are living in Hungarian, living in Germany, they usually kiss each other, you know, that's probably okay. But if shaking hands calls you to think otherwise, don't do that. But I think normal, normal people don't think that. So, so, and also a good rule of thumb is out of sight, out of mind. Don't torture yourself. Keep your mind busy because I preach a sermon called Lash, Thou Shalt Meditate. You know, keep your verse in your head when you try to end in temptation. Think about some verses to keep you accountable. And if you not, if you cannot contain, if you if you are burning in lust, and, and you are sure that person is who God's for you, get married. If that's what the Bible says. But sometimes you have to be patient. Sometimes you have to wait for a month. Maybe you have to wait for years based on your age. Maybe you are 16 or 15 and you are dating. You can't marry until you are 18. You have to wait three or two years. You have to be patient. I'm, I'm all for you marrying young, but you have to make sure that person is who God's for you. So number one. Date, a beliefs, born again, say Christian. Number two, let God guide you, be patient. Number three, hard worker for man, housekeeper for woman. Number four, make not provision for the flesh, talking about physical contact. And number five, have rules. Have rules. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. It's the fifth book of the Bible in the beginning of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 22. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 13. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 13, the Bible reads, If any man take a wife and go in unto her, and hate her, and give occasions of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring for the tokens of the damsel's virginity, unto the elders of the city in the gate. So you have a story that a man and a woman are getting married. And and a woman, I'm sorry, and the husband was accusing that his, her, his wife is not a maid. Basically, he's accusing her, his wife is not a virgin. So, so her parents brought all the evidence to the elders to judge. If she is a virgin, go to verse 19, the Bible says, they shall amass, means to afflict him, in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he had brought up an evil name. If she is a virgin, then the husband should pay for his wife's father, because she has falsely accused her. But, verse 20, if this be true, if she is not a virgin, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the, to the door of her father's house, and the man of her city shall stone her with stones that she died because she had brought folly in Israel. Basically, if she is a virgin, then the husband should pay because she has brought up an evil name. But she, if she is not a virgin, she shall be stoned, she shall be killed. Now, throughout the Old Testament, when you see that, there's a pattern. The father is always responsible for daughter's virginity. If you read uh, Deuteronomy 22 in, 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 in its entirety, you will see that picture. The father is always responsible for daughter's virginity. Virginity, and 
There's no parents here, right? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> so, when you become a parent, you should always protect your children. You have some rules to protect your children, to protect them so that the name of God will not be defiled, so that the name of God be not blasphemed. And ideally, daughters, daughters should always be chaperoned or protected by his father or brothers or trusted adults. Again, I'm not a huge fan of women working, but ideally, the father should be provided for the daughter, and when you're married, the husband can provide for your wife. But if, if you are not being provided, then it doesn't work because you have to live, right? If you are being provided, then ideally, wives should be keepers at home, a full-time housekeeper. So, young men, you need to work hard so that you don't have to send your wife to work in the future. Maybe instead of sending your wife to work, you have two, two jobs, two full-time jobs. It's doable. Six day week, how to work hard. You should be able to provide for your family, otherwise, you are worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible says. And, and you may think that you can earn more money by sending your wife to work, but you may end up to paying more taxes, right? And then you, you may probably not feel like cooking from scratch. And also, you may probably need two cars or the insurance costs piling up. And your wife will probably need more clothing. Right? Probably some job require them to wear some promiscuous clothing. That's a lot of money. And when you're having kids, if you are all working, you'll pro probably put them in a daycare. By the way, daycare means you don't care. Okay. So I, I don't want to put my kids into a daycare or something. That's why I think the Bible is right, talking about women should be keepers at home, ideally. Because if you add up all these costs, both of you are working, you don't really earn that much money. Seriously. Putting up all the tax, or the vehicle, or the clothing, or the cooking, or the food, or the daycare cost, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So, if I have a daughter, I don't have a daughter, I'm only 20 years old, I'll be turning 21 on Friday, God, God willing. Um, <laughs> if I have a daughter, or plural, daughters, so if they want something, and, and if it's good, I will give it to them. I will not allow them to work. That's why we want to work hard so we can provide for our family in the future. And, and for if I have some sons, right, if I have some boys, if, if they turn to the legal age of working, I will send them to work. People may say, you have a double standard. Yes, double standard, because men and women are created equal but different roles, okay? If I only have one standard, why don't they just go to the same bathroom with the same clothing, men wearing skirts, you know, these kind of junks. Of course, they are double standard, and, and, and the culture of the world may tell you, oh, it's all the same. Sorry, the Bible says God has made us a peculiar treasure. It means we are strange. Sorry, I am strange. I think man and woman are different, okay? I'm strange. Is that strange to think that? The Bible says there's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither bond or free. There's neither male or female, for we are all one in Christ. Considering the value, we are created equal in value, but different in roles. In the same way, Women cannot be pastors. In the same way, men cannot be Virgin Marys. <laughs> Different roles, okay? N not, not one standard. I, of course I will have a double standard. I will treat my son and daughter differently because they're created with different roles. And I don't want to be a woman. And I, I'm pretty sure you don't want to be a man either, right? God created you with a purpose, so live that. Yes, double standard. Sorry, I am strange. I am special because we are God's people. The problem is whether we want to take a stand. So, young man, you may have more freedom than ladies because you are going to be independent, going to be a leader one day, and your wife is going to look up to you, and you will be the head of the family. Okay, and your kids are going to look up to you. Your wife has to submit to you, so we make sure you are a strong leader, a strong worker, start building the work ethic right now so that you don't have to send your wife to work. Even if you send them, you don't have to earn that much money. Seriously, you can all the hidden costs up there. So we have talked about five points, five dating advice, five principles. Number one, believer. Number two, let God guide you. Number three, a hard worker, full-time housekeeper for women. Number four, make not provision for the flesh. Talking about physical contact, normal contact is okay, but don't go overboard. Number five, have rules, protection, protection. Again, if you are a single lady who's working, be careful at the workforce. Okay, be very careful out there. And just be patient, let God guide you and enjoy life. Being a Christian is not hard, it's not so boring. Because every day I was at 
Purdue University, I was looking forward to going to church on Wednesday night, Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday, Sunday night. I was looking forward to having fellowship with believers because you should not have any fellowship with the NSA, with, with, with the infidel, with Belial anyway. So I'm looking forward to that. And also after this preaching, after this message, I'll probably talk to some of you to just have some fellowship, just to chat. So just enjoy life and let God guide you. And just keep in mind that God always has the best for you. Let's bow ahead and have a word of prayer, Lord. Thank you so much for this wonderful time to preach, Lord. I pray you'll help dig this message in our heart to really apply that in our life. Because we are at that age, Lord, I pray that, I pray that you give us the guidance, strength of our faith. Make sure every step we take is according to your will, not by our own understanding. And keep us in your word. Keep us nourished in your commandment so that we can fully love you so that people will see us as God's people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.